Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and uh, Squamish nations. Um, welcome. Uh, I'm going to introduce our guests in a second, but um, just so you know, this microphone is not intended to broadcast into this room, but is actually part of our live feed to uh, HowlRound TV. And if you want to, um, it, it will be available for viewing later, but if you feel, feel free to participate via Twitter, and the hashtag is New Plays. Okay, so Playwrights Theatre Centre is a theatre company that finds, nurtures, and advances Canadian playwrights, and we're interested in asking questions about how to make theatre in collaboration, um, in which there's a communication between the artists and the audience, and in most cases, no matter how the work is created, a uh, writer is involved. So, um, of course, playwrights are kind of interested. We know playwrights are interested in seeing where gaming can get them, or wh whether there are jobs and what kind of work <laughs> there is. Um, and we're hoping that, uh, that you who are in the gaming industry are interested in talking about story, because that's what we like to talk about as much as possible. So the challenge is to expand the amount of interaction between the audience and the performance um, in, in theater. Uh, and that's partly, I'm sure, because of social media. It's partly because people believe it's more democratic. It's partly because it might make a more meaningful experience. So um, we thought we'd just get some experts in gaming to talk to us about this. And so we, uh, we first approached A. Thomas Goldberg right here, over here, and he gave me a list of books to read. And when you see on my desk all the stickies that are in the, <laughs> in the corners, you'll know that I, I found it really stimulating, and I'm, I'm sure he's going to have lots to say about this. And then we, um, we talked to Alexandra Mandrik Mandrika, who um, is primarily a de game designer, and, and Amanda Duaro, and the three of them agreed to join us for this conversation. So we'll get to that in a couple minutes. This is what we're going to do. Um, we'll start with each of the four of us talking about what interests us most about the topic of interactive storytelling. Then I'm going to ask a few questions. Um, we'll have a little kind of four-way discussion. And then we'll take a little bio break. And then, and I mean a little one, short. And then we'll come back and open the floor for your questions. <coughs> then after we've left a little time for... Um, us to fool around with some games that are outside and to have a, you know, a, a, a little bit of refreshment and all that kind of stuff. So that's the plan for the evening. Um, and, uh, okay, are we, are we good? <laughs> In the theater, we've been talking about how to tell stories for about 2,000 years, so we have quite a lot of conversation about it, and uh, I, I, it wasn't until I talked to A. Thomas that I had an idea that, in fact, the ga games gamers have been talking about it too for how long did you say? 20, 30 years? Oh, it's. I mean, people have been talking about stories and with regard to games for probably as long as there have been games. Probably. So most of the theories of drama have been about um, store uh, about explanations made uh, about what is what it takes to make a good drama which and in fact the earliest theories about it didn't even actually mention story so but I'm taking um, Barry Boyd that I don't know if you've ever heard of him he, he wrote a, a book called the origin of stories and which he talks about story as being an evolutionary advantage that this is how we learn how to be in the world. So um, rehearsals for life. And in theater, we talk about kind of the origins of story being either in children's play or in ritual. So in you know kids' play, you give throw a bunch of kids together with no props <laughs> and no no nothing in their hands, no cards, no nothing. They will in invent uh, a scenario and they'll all take on characters and they'll play it for hours until they usually end up like trashing somebody's fort, I think is usually how it ends up um, in my recollection. But they are telling stories. Um, so we're pretty sure 
that people find pleasure in the bits of agency that stories, inside of stories, and that's where games come in. So that's kind of it. Now, we've been working in theater for a long time. For those of you who don't really go to plays, which might be some of you, um, the theater has really changed a lot in the last few years, and even in, in Vancouver, um, we, we've seen quite a few different kinds of work that have virtually no story. I mean, I'm thinking about 100% Vancouver. I don't know if you saw that, but it, it was a collection of 100 people from who represented different parts of Vancouver uh, trying to lay laying it out demographically and was actually, for the most part, a recitation of statistics. So they divided themselves up on stage according to how many were male, how many were female, how many lived in this place and how many lived in the next. And it was, it was a very emotional experience. I had a very emotional experience during the whole thing, but I don't think you could actually call it a story. There were stories involved. People came up and told little pieces of stories, but there were no real stories involved. So uh, it's, it, but it was still a really great collection of stuff. So it, it's kind of a, a good question about what makes, uh, how much story is required in a, in a piece. Um, but when I start thinking about what games and theater had in common, I thought that the most basic, at the most basic level, theater ha and games require somebody to be physically present and to do something. Like, even if it's only to sit in the dark. Um, if, if, you know, there's an old rock song, I think it's got a lyric that says, if there are no audience, there ain't no show. And, and that's pretty much true. I mean, if, if there is no one to laugh, there is no comedy. And you can, it, it, it's, it requires the audience, even if an audience seems to be doing nothing, they are participating, they're creating, um, they're participating in a story. And there are all kinds of stories that are being seen in the same theater piece. There's a story that we're watching. There's the story that we're creating in our own heads. There's, there may be a story that we're participating in making, and um, there's a story that we tell our, each other after we go home or in the bar after, you know, this is what I saw. And they're not the same necessarily as the order of incidents in the plot, so it's interesting what makes a story. So the big question we ask ourselves when we're making a theater piece is how to provide a mental an emotional journey for the audience, and I'm sure that's the same question that gets asked when you're creating a game. So, um, I just thought I'd mention, invite someone else to talk to you about um, a case study of something that I'm working on. I'm working on a piece called uh, Foreign Radical, theater conspir with theater conspiracy, and I've got Tim Carlson here who can tell you more about it. It's about cyber surveillance. And we're trying to create a combination of fiction and documentary and game to express this story. So I'm gonna get Tim to replace me for a minute and, and uh, he can tell you about it. Thanks. <clears throat> we're probably um, maybe halfway through developing this piece, so there's a lot that we're still learning about it and just experimenting with at this point. Uh, right now it looks like we're going to be making a show for an audience of up to 30 who will be uh, some walls and uh, curtains that move that at times will divide the audience depending on whether they um, are more concerned about their privacy in a certain situation or um, in uh, being secure. Um, so as Kathleen said, it's a mix of documentary and dramatic scenes dealing with cyber surveillance, um, um, internet censorship, uh, and uh, issues of that kind. Um, is this started about two years ago when I met a really interesting guy named Ron Debert. He's a uh, world-renowned expert in this area who uh, runs the Citizen Lab at the U of T. 
and um, we worked on developing something together, and this was in the nine months before uh, the Snowden revelations, which kind of uh, blew the doors wide open into um, a larger and deeper investigation of the area. Uh, but one critical thing that we were talking about right from the beginning is what the what should the audience experience of of this place um, of these uh, issues be? How the, how can we connect them really in an interesting personal way uh, to themes that are um, all about uh, pretty heady um, into technology, uh, legal policy, uh, um, uh, geopolitics, I guess. And what we hit on was that, well, when people are online, what are they doing? They're offering opinions. They're going exploring. Um, they're kind of blazing their own trail through um, through material. So we wanted to bring that concept uh, to the audience, the audience into the space, um, which is cyberspace largely, and uh, get them to interact um, through applying some gaming elements. Kathleen, in her monumental research project <laughs> for this piece came across a really interesting uh, little bit of um, history in, in the development of the internet, which was uh, cryptographers uh, in the US in the uh, late 80s, 90s, pretty, cr pretty radical bunch overall, uh, were figuring out onion rooting torrents, those kind of things, and uh, as a way to um, keep secrets from the government, from corporations. And uh, they made this game with envelopes, uh, which was an encryption game, and it was basically a party game where they were passing envelopes and trying to snoop on each other or maintain each other's secrets. And the more we talked about that, the more interesting we thought that would be within a theater environment because uh, rather than doing something on iPhones or um, on headphones, that kind of thing, people are actually have something tactile in their hands, um, handling each other's secrets um, and noticing things about each other. Uh, this is one reason why it made sense to have a small um, uh, audience so they would get to know each other uh, and see if they make any effort to maintain each other's secrets or just steal each other's <laughs> secrets. Or, uh, so that's where we're at right now is trying to develop this encryption game as part of the uh, as part of the playmaking. And we're gonna have a week at the University of Toronto next week to work on it. And uh, in July, we'll do um, a trial, a workshop presentation in Richmond at the York Continent Festival. We'll need lots of people to test this with because it doesn't work without an audience. <laughs> um, so we're open to having lots of volunteers to help us out. Great. So the biggest thing, the challenge that we found in trying to make this happen, and that's why I asked Tim to talk about it, is that um, it became clear to us that there was no really good way to have the audience affect the fictional elements of the play and still maintain any artistic control. So it's the question of how to integrate those two elements and whether they were even compatible in any way, what, shape or form. And so anybody who's got any ideas about that, Tim and I want to hear from you. <laughs> so just let us know. And, but that's kind of the kind of thing that's being that's happening in theater, that we're trying to make it a real experience and not just a, a, a really authentic experience, a, a, an experience where people actually do make decisions that have consequences. Because the biggest thing about theater is, of course, like play, um, all the decisions have no real consequences, except in your mind. So, so 
that's where we're coming from at this point when we start to talk to you people. And um, so I'd like to hear more. So uh, I'd like, first of all, to introduce um, Amanda Duaro, who is a writer who started off in theater, I understand, or at least has some experience writing with theater. She worked in Magnif Magnetic North Festival as well as any other places. And she is, um, um, she worked at Slant Six Games, Propaganda Games at uh, Electronic Arts, and she currently writes, she works as a writer for Microsoft. And I've asked Amanda to tell us how she got into this and what she thinks. <laughs> how I got into it. So, well, I first should say my uh, theater writing background is pretty low. Um, I just had like a stage reading at Ottawa International Writers Festival, but I did work for Mag Magnetic North, which is how, and that was when I lived in Ottawa, and that's how I learned how much interactive theater is, was especially coming out of Vancouver, um, because it was a national theater festival, got to meet lots of people and see a lot of their work. Um, how I got into it, uh, well, I have played games since I was a kid, um, and, and fairly seriously, um, for most of my life, um, and was even, I have an English degree, I love reading, I love, and I loved writing short stories and screenplays, but somehow the idea that the games that I loved had writing in them, uh, eluded me <laughs> for <laughs> many, many, shamelessly too many years. Um, and so shortly after I finished my script writing program, a friend of mine was like, um, that told me about the National Screen Institute had this program just once, unfortunately, um, where they uh, accepted submissions from Canadians um, and from all different type, right, who have written for lots of different things, so novels, uh, theater, script writing, poets, um, and then they selected 10 of us and then they sent us to Vancouver for a boot camp, um, essentially. So I had, they had brought in mentors from all the studios in town and they, we'd have these sessions where it would just be kind of a lecture session and then they'd put us in these groups. And it felt kind of like, it felt very much like a reality TV show, like scenarios they kept putting us in. Um, they gave us, so my group was given um, uh, to do a first person shooter based on Pan's Labyrinth. And, and so we stayed up all night and we came up with an idea that made sense with that IP and that concept. And then the next day they're like, okay, cyborgs are now in, so you have to include cyborgs into your idea. And then the next day they're like, okay, well, you've lost the IP, you have to take out everything without like sacrificing a lot of money. You can't change everything. You just have to take out the Pan's Labyrinth IP. And so it's as silly and stressful as that sounds. <laughs> It's, it, and maybe a bit of an exaggeration, that is what the games industry is. It is just as much problem solving and like uh, putting out fires <laughs> as it is cre being creative. Um, and then coming off of that, I, had, I was given a mentor, uh, his name is Ian Christie, and he was fantastic. And, um, and he would basically give me feedback on this game concept that I was to work on for three months like everything, the game design, the, I, the, the characters, everything, completely unrealistic. That is not what the writer <laughs> will, as much as we like to hope that it would just be our own creation, that part of the program was a bit misleading, um, but still learned a lot from it. Um, being a writer is, in video games is very collaborative and there's constant compromise, um, and, but if, without doing that, you're not gonna make a really great experience. Um, so coming out of that, I got my first, it was just like a two-week story consultant like contract VA where they had a game design issue that they didn't want to change because it cost too much money and they're like, can you come up with a story solution that would essentially kind of gloss over <laughs> this weird design issue. Um, and uh, so that was how it all started. I got contacts there and then after that I worked uh, for one of Disney's companies, and then at Slant Six, and Radical, and with A. Thomas at Black Tusk. Um, and so yeah, once you kind of get get in there, you get to learn, you meet lots of people, that's kind of how you do really grow and evolve in the games industry. So that's my story. So can you tell us a little bit about what writers do? <laughs> um, depends how early you come in. Um, if you get in there early enough, you are actually 
um, helping to come up with a story. And usually you're just helping to come up with a story. A lot of stories in video games, unless you have a creative director who's kind of like the, the guy at the top there, or the girl, <laughs> ideally a lot more, um, they are the ones, if they have somebody who is a creative director and a writer, that's ideal. Because they are going to be the ones that say yes, no to the story. And But generally, story is not just decided by the writers in the games industry. It's decided by the design director, the creative director, if, even if they have no writing background, um, art directors. It is story by committee, <laughs> which is has a lot of pitfalls to it. Um, and so it's trying to still find a... a um, um, some truth and some key theme that at least to come out of it that that's the, the thing that you should always be working with as a group together for um, and so yeah so the writers sometimes are in there to kind of help guide that process um, and oftentimes I'll, like the, the, the games that I have shipped was more when I came in very late and it was just writing dialogue that now is like explains why that character has to go over there or it's even writing like text that says that player goes over there. Um, yeah, there's a lot of different things to be writing in a game. So, so do you, just one more question, and then mm -hmm. I'll turn it, ask, ask Alexandra to talk about this, but do you, like, do you think there is more room for story <coughs> in games than there are games with story, or? Um. Not right now. I actually think that story is um, being is being included a lot more in games. I think there's still some process problems that need to be addressed, but there's still story is heavily involved, and um, and I think in some cases uh, story shouldn't be so much involved, especially in like a more casual game or a game that already has enough legs that a lot of the narrative is emergent. Um, I, I it, it's more of a, a quality not quantity issue I think right now. So that's, yeah. Okay, we'll pick on some, up on some of that <laughs> in a little bit. <laughs> quantity and quality, huh? Okay. Um, Alexandra Mandrika is, um, has worked as the Director of Design at Ubisoft Montreal and Relic Entertainment and has been involved with many, what is an AAA brand? Triple A, okay, just like you guys. Yeah, exactly. The Triple A, <laughs> Assassin's Creed, Company of Heroes, and Splinter Cell. And his his uh, company is called Game Whispering Inc. And, and and he consults on design, creative vision, and creative coaching. And um, if you go to his the website for uh, Game Whispering, you find some really interesting stuff. So um, I you? absolutely you recommend it. Um, so. Alex, would you like to talk a little bit about what you do and what you think the place of story is in games? Yeah, well, maybe actually as an echo as what you said, um, you describe writing in games as very like an afterthought most of the time, you know? And actually, my was five years into my career, but my first like enlightenment moment was at Ubisoft, where they really have almost a movie like process to to the creative process where at the very early stage you have that creative director that has well with his team develop that concept or that message they want to, to, to tell and then each discipline tries to find technical solutions to implement it but for, from the very start so um, and, and so the, <clears throat> the question of the place of story, actually, when, when we first discussed, uh, Caitlin, the, your first question was, how do I implement interactivity in a play? And my answer was, the question is not how, the question is why. You know, the, the, the dichotomy we have between should a game be more about story or more about gameplay I think is a very limited, limiting uh, dichotomy because it's not, it's not exclusive. Like you, you, you can have one with another and you don't have one to the expense of the other. You actually select the right tools to support your message and build your, your, 
uh, experience, as we were discussing uh, earlier. So, yeah, you know, it's interesting because you actually mentioned um, how much story do you need to have a, a theater play. And it's actually pretty interesting because nowadays, with more widespread uh, and accessible tools to build games, there's a mo more of a kind of a nouveau vague uh, indie scene mm -hmm. with people that actually want to create and be more, uh, convey more uh, deep messages. And then you have the, the people call them gamer, gamers, you know, and, and actually people come here and say, oh, you're a gamer. No, I'm a game developer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not here because I'm a gamer. I, I'm here because I develop games. Right? And, <coughs> and Time to play games. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the gamers actually react very negatively to these new story-driven games and say, these are not even games anymore. So it's actually the same in, 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 in a mirror effect where they say, oh, but there's not enough uh, interaction, so it's not even a game. But my, my answer to this is really, you know, these definitions are helpful when they're helpful. It's almost like saying, an audio book, is it a book? A choose your own adventure book, is it a game? Or is it a book? I mean, really, <clears throat> you use definitions when they help you, but you shouldn't let them limit you. So <clears throat> the key is you use the tools you need to support your intention and create the message you want to convey. So that's why I, ask, I answered you the question is not how, the question is why. Why? So yeah, you, you gave me the role of being yeah. the contradictor here. <laughs> <laughs> You're not asking the, the right question, maybe that's because I'm French. Uh, I was gonna say, I don't think I gave you that role. <laughs> okay. But I, you do it gracefully, I have to say. Um, you've been in game, in, in making games, designing games for quite a long time. Can you talk a little bit about how you got involved? Uh, yeah, I've been making video games for 14 years now. And at one point I realized I don't want to do all these test tubes and everything. And, and I looked at games, which I enjoyed. And it's actually pretty interesting because all the psychology and you know, learning about the, 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 the human brain you realize that it really applies on how to make a good game because you have to understand what, what is entertaining, what do we respond to. And so, so yeah, it actually made sense at one point. Um, but, but really, I think, so you know, as you introduced me, I'm a game designer, whatever it means. But really, I'm interested in the creative process of coming up with that message you want to touch your audience with and then selecting the right techniques and tools to find these forms and the technical solutions. And by technique, I don't mean programming. I just mean lighting or photography or, or writing or game design or animation. All of these are techniques. And by techniques, I mean means to support your intention. So, and you know, like I think that that's where creating a theater play or, or, or creating a painting or creating a video game or a movie has to follow the same creative process even though sometimes you could be doing it, everything on your own. But you, in, in a way, you have to be schizophrenic and have these different people talk to one another in an organized way. So I, I would say it's actually harder to do it as a single individual because you have to manage your own madness <laughs> so anyways, yeah, I think that's pretty interesting. I have to write that down. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to put it on my bulletin board next to me. Manage your own meds. <laughs> um, a. Thomas Goldberg is a 20-year veteran of the digital entertainment industry, and I believe you have a connect theater connection as well. You said you designed sets at one point. <laughs> I mean... Uh, specializes in the creation of interactive character performances for games and other means. It's, and he's currently the president of Lifelight and Believable Animation Design, Inc. 
And I am very curious about what you mean by creation of interactive character performances. So I'm sure you're going to tell me. Uh, sure. <laughs> um, actually, when after we spoke about that, I realized that um, that uh, my history in sort of interactive uh, experiences actually goes back now 30 years. Um, I uh, went to school for film in New York, um, and uh, but while I was in school, I spent two years working for uh, an exhibit design firm that was doing uh, interactive exhibit design. Um, and my job was to design, and this was at a time when to, to build anything, this was before we had Flash or even any, you know, and so building an exhibit literally meant physically building the hardware and the circuit boards and um, I didn't do any of that part, um, but my job was to design sort of paper and pencil versions of these experiences and then bring people in and have them play them and to try to glean, you know, some insights from these um, that we could use before actually going and spending the thousands of dollars to build these things. Um, and, uh, and as I said, because we were, you know, this was at a time before there weren't any of these sort of interactive media forms, like everything we did was completely different and from scratch. I mean, we built a, um, for one location-based entertainment project, um, we had built, we had designed 30 games. Um, we built three of them in the studio, and uh, one which was called Friday Night Food Fight, which was a boxing food trivia game. <laughs> um, and, and the way you played Friday Night Food Fight is you actually stood with three other people in a boxing ring, um, the center of which had a video chandelier and speed bags under each of four monitors facing you, a question would be asked and you had to be the first one to punch uh, the right answer to get the, the answer. Um, we did another game uh, uh, which we designed was called Mystery Hotel, which um, the final design of it was gonna be a three-story building um, where you had to go and search for clues to a, you know, in a mystery. Um, and uh, you know, and so as we had about 30 of those, there were many more that we had uh, that were rejected. There was one uh, that the president of the, the company had come up with, uh, which was called Cab Aroma. The whole idea of this was you were supposed to sit in the back of this cab, like a physical cab, and find your way around New York City by sense of smell. <laughs> Fortunately, there were some technical and, and aesthetic reasons why that didn't go forward. But <laughs> But, but you get the idea, of, like it wasn't a, you know, you didn't start with the, okay, we're gonna put it on a screen and put a controller in your hand. It was really the fundamentals of what, was, what were people physically going to be doing as part of this experience was, was part of the questions that were asked. Um, as you said, when I, when I graduated from, uh, um, from the NYU Film School, I spent several years, actually the first thing I did when I graduated is I, I went and joined a traveling circus, which I think is, everyone should do fresh out of college. Um, and, uh, but after I finished that, um, I worked for several years as a lighting designer, um, did some set design, but primarily as a lighting designer in New York. Um, and I worked in, in theater and dance and live music and really gave me kind of a very broad exposure to different kinds of performance. Um, and, uh, you know, and so kind of out of that, you know, over the years, um, you know, it really, you know, I was never kind of kind of locked into kind of any sort of one um, sort of mode of performance. And the whole question of like the different types of relationships between artist and audience had always been fascinating to me. Um, and, uh, you know, and this kind of right before, sort of right before I got out of theater, kind of the last year, which was right around 93, um, I had started doing a bunch of interactive uh, installation and perform. Um, performances uh, in New York. Um, probably the last big one was a project I did called the Works on Shirts Project, where I invited um, 18 artists, New York City-based artists, um, ultimately produced uh, 21 works that were executed on the backs of uh, white cotton dress shirts, sort of button-up dress shirts. And over the course of two weekends, we entered um, the Met, the two MoMAs, uh, the MoMA, the two Guggenheims, and the Whitney. Um, and what we would do, this was in 93 week, um, we'd enter, the, everyone would sort of circulate through the museum at a given time. Um, we all sort of met at a prearranged um, location, 
Um, and uh, essentially everyone sort of lined up in a grid and we spent the next hour sort of doing a, an art gallery inside the museum. Um, and yeah, it was kind of, I mean, it was sort of a flash mob before there were flash mobs, but um, it wasn't so much about being kind of disruptive. In fact, we tried to do it in a way that wasn't. Um, but what was really looking at is we had the artists themselves were the ones wearing the shirts and it was about the artists engaging directly with the people who would then view it. And it was kind of just looking at the way museums and, and the way we thought of art at the time where you, know, you go to a museum and some person you don't know who's curated it and you never see and never meet has decided the art on the wall by artists who you never see and you never meet. And then based on little plaques where it's kind of like that's our whole experience of the art. Um, and so this was just kind of a little way of sort of like kind of challenging that or just challenging the idea of that. Um, it was shortly after that that I ended up um, going back to NYU, not as a student this time, um, but as artist in residence at the Media Research Lab. Um, and this is where I really, I started working on um, in interactive animation. Um, and once in my focus then, and has been over the years, has really been about how do we give artists the tools to be able to, kind of, as, as Alex said, like, you know, deliver a message through, you know, through an interactive performance. How can we create characters that can engage with the audience, the player, um, if it's a game, um, in a way that they can respond meaningfully to the player's actions and the player's actions themselves can have meaning and can kind of create this dialogue um, you know, in circumstances where the artist can't be present, unlike theater, you know, they're not there to interact directly, so they have to be able to kind of um, embed these sort of dramatic rules and the rules of the narrative in the characters that are then going to be the player was then going to interact with. Um, and, uh, you know, so I've done that for several years. Um, uh, I worked at uh, EA for a number of years. I built the animation system that's currently in use in all of EA's games. Um, and since leaving there, I worked at, uh, at Relic with Alex and then worked at uh, Black Dusk with Amanda and now I'm kind of doing my own thing. I'm working on a number of different projects. So. When you talk about Performance. What what does that mean in video game terms? Um. So I think that I mean it's it's not too dissimilar from when we talk about the performance, you know, a performance in theater or in or in film. Um, you know, we have characters that are are playing a role, um, and they have to deliver that. You know, they have to kind of be in that character and deliver that role and. And can deliver the intention of the artists um, in uh, through their interaction with the player. Now, that can take on different forms. As I said, every you know every game is different, and you know. And the interesting thing about games, to me, is that the art form itself, I think, at its heart, is about defining interaction. You know, it's about defining the, the sort of interactive form, um, and that that for me is what game design is. And we've had these discussions about there are a lot of people who call themselves game designers who I don't know that that's necessarily an apt term if you're making another first person shooter and the model of the game, you know, the design of the game is basically essentially the same as a game you've done before or someone's worked on before. I don't know that you back errors, but um, but unless, you know, in my mind, unless you are designing the mechanics, and the mechanics are really what define the interaction between the player and the game, and, um, then, you know, I think that's really, as I said, kind of that's what makes it interesting. And so, because of that, the role that characters play, and the role that story plays, and the role, you know, is going to be different in every case, um, because it's a matter of how those tools, you know, play into delivering the intention of Right. So, well, just to pick up on something, I noticed on your website um, you were talking about three different types of design, how it's motivation design, system design, and interaction design. So could you talk a little bit about what those three different things are? <clears throat> well, actually, so my definition of game design is simply not the, the idea of the game itself, which to me is more like the game director or the creative director of the, the game. To me, a game designer comes and designs the way you engage the player, the way you motivate him, the way, so the way you reward him, 
that's mainly psychology, uh, you know, cognitive science, everything that. So that's where like understanding the human brain is actually pretty interesting. How you engage and motivate him, and and, and so how he learns or how, how she learns. Um, system design is really. At first, I thought it was the core of game design. It's really that the game rules. So it's like chess. Okay, how the the, the pawns move? How do you take another piece? You know, it's like read the game rules, the game systems, the logic of the game, the the, the mathematic, uh, the logic uh, system. And and the last one is the interaction design where. So the game, in the game, you have to make decisions. And you, you talked about action, but it's also about decisions. And so the game gives you information about the game state. And based on your understanding of the system that we discussed in the second part, you make your decision. But then once you've made your decision, you have to input back your decision into the game itself. And so that's the inter interface and, and reaction. So that whole loop is the in interaction loop. And um, <clears throat> and actually, you know, I think I'm going to wait for your next question. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, no! Uh, you know, but so, so for me, these are the three technical branches of game design. Then you have level design, which is more about almost like s uh, setting up the stage and being like a, a director of your of your scene. So it's actually interesting because a game designer for me is more in the mathematical realm, logic and systems, and level design is more in the director, is directing that scene. But what's really interesting, well, what's sad or interesting is in the industry, it's seen as better, higher level, or more enviable to be a game designer because that's how you get to creative direction. Well, to me, a level designer is way more closer, way, way closer to being a creative director because he's interacting with the, the, he's the last line of defense, the first point of contact to the player because he's shaping that experience saying, I need a palm tree here, I need violin strings here, you know. He's actually building that set pretty much like you would in a theater play. So. And then the last one is uh, narrative design, where you need to write, you need to understand player-centric plotting, like how, how to write a story where the player is the protagonist, or instead of, of a non-playing character, as we call them in the industry. So that's a, a dif different skill. But I actually break it down into these categories so then you can learn it, because there's academic background behind it, instead of saying, game design, fun, have game ideas, go. <laughs> well, you were saying, Amanda, that it's very collaborative, this whole game design thing. Um, can you talk about a little bit about who's involved and who has a stake and who's the boss? And <laughs> when it comes to an entire game or yeah. just the story? Or the story. The we'll story. start with the no, story. Okay. Uh, it's everyone with the game. <laughs> um, so with the story, um, I'm usually, I'm always with the designers. The design, like the lead designer and the creative director, they're always involved. Um, and often audio will get involved as well. And, um, and, but I found lately, and I actually do prefer this, that we are also bringing in art and we're bringing in animation. Because what I've, I've noticed is that when I first started out especially, and I still notice some resistance to this, is once the writer gets involved, the kind of the expectation is the story is figured out like three years before the game ships and nothing should change, yet the game is constantly changing. Um, and, or just that the writer will write this story which will be these interactive cutscenes in between the action, like the playable parts, yet there's no communication between what I wrote in that cinematic, that non-interactive thing that said what your motivation was, or just kind of pinned something on there, and what the gameplay is. And so I find not necessarily that everyone needs a stake in it. I think like 
how many people actually influence the story, like make those major decisions should be kept small, because then if you go too large, you get very generic. Um, but I think the people who should be always kept involved and always feeding back ideas about the narrative should be large. Um, in, on a game that I worked with A. Thomas on, the way we worked is we were in pods, and a pod would have like uh, an animator and a few artists, a programmer, a couple designers, a writer, um, um, and, and audio would also be involved too towards the end of that project. And, um, and we would do entire maps, so it would be like, okay, this is the story, like, you know, give them the, the basic idea of what emotion we want and the major points that we have to kind of hit. But otherwise, brainstorming, like, okay, animation, like, what is something that you could bring to the table that, in, that empowers this entire experience? And story, and the thing that I think story is, always has to factor in, probably more than anything else, is the design. Like, making sure that whatever that playable thing, what you're playing, st is true to what story you're telling. Because if they do this, it doesn't matter. Like, people are gonna, if it, even if you write something really great in a cutscene, if it just feels disjointed, you just wanna skip, like you do, yeah. So, um, so I, okay. I thought you were like, yes, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> so actually, I have an anecdote in this. Okay. That, that's a splinter cell, and you're always sneaking around like this. Mm -hmm. And so you're actually trying to dodge the cars, and then you get to the, that door, which they tell you, exit the, 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 the scene now. Then you open the door, and then that crazy cutscene is running, there's an explosion, <laughs> and then he, he jumps in the <laughs> chopper and he's like, that was, that was so close. And that's so not what you were playing. So that's, that's where, you know, as you said, it needs to be coordinated. Yes. yes. So, so which game was that? Uh, to sell. So there, there's, a, there's a term that's used in academic circles um, that kind of describes this, which is called it's, um, Ludo narrative dissonance is the term. Um, Ludo from being game and narrative being obviously narrative, um, and it's the idea where the gameplay and the and the story that are being told conflict with each other in a way. Um, and so you know if you've got a story where you know you're supposed to be you know this guy who's <coughs> you know trying to you know trying to bring peace to some area, but the entire gameplay is you running around <laughs> shooting up as many people as you can. You know, that's the example. And, and I think it, it comes down to, it's very easy in these situations to create situations where what I call kind of, you know, there's the explicit narrative, which is the story that you're trying to tell. Um, you know, and there's the implicit narrative, which is the story that comes out of the experience. It's kind of the story that when you go back and you describe what happened as you played. Um, and, you know, when a game I think is done really, really well, um, those two are very much in, in, in line. You have a story that's well. I can say, well, if this was the story the characters went through, and you know, and I felt the same way as they did as I as I played it, um, and uh, but you know, in many cases where, as Amanda was pointing out, you know, where a story may have been written and sort of nailed and locked down here, but the designers have gone in a completely different direction, you get a thing where it's like, you know, well, I think they were telling me it was about this, but when I played it, it was about this, and it just feels weird and disjoint and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and often I've been, been brought on way later um, where early on in a project the story was figured out by another writer or from like the, the, the heads of the studio. Um, and then, and so I, th I think that the team kind of keeps that story in mind and then two years later, right before we reach Alpha, which is kind of our kind of lockdown for new content, um, they'll bring me in and be like, okay, none of our objectives make sense with these cinematics, can you just like ham fist in some dialogue <laughs> that says, well, technically that still made sense because, and then it goes on. But unless, yeah, unless that gameplay just feeds, like the, the story doesn't match it, you can like exposit all you want why that really made sense when it didn't. Um, it's, it, it, by that point, the player is zoned out. They're just like, I'll just read the objective. Okay, I'm gonna, you know. And which means they, like, the, they're still an enjoyable experience there, but it's, I, it, it is, it's less rich. That's what, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you're playing a game, and, and, and I think it's either the case, if, if either you want to skip the gameplay or skip the, you know, the, the sort of narrative point parts of it or the, you know, the non-interactive parts of it, then the, then the designers, you know, the people who made the game have, like, have failed at level, haven't kind of achieved, um, you know, I think the sort of ideal kind of goal. 
Hmm. You guys have all talked at one point or another about a game called Heavy Rain, is that what it's called? Um, and it has elicited really a lot of interesting conversation. So um, is there, can we just explain a little bit about what that, what that game is about and then talk about who you are in that game and how it appears? Or how you, how you, how you follow the action in that story. There is a story involved in Heavy Rain, is there not? Maybe oh, I'm just saying, okay. I'm not a huge David Cage fan. <laughs> I'm like the, the worst one. Um, so, uh, Heavy Rain, it's been years since I played it. I never finished it, so. Uh, <laughs> okay, I won't <laughs> ask you. So, that. the idea is basically that you are, you start off the, the game and you're, you're just kind of like this everyday guy. You're playing with your kids, like everything, and you're, it's just kind of a more of a mundane life, and everything you do is just interactive. It just kind of asks you to participate in what essentially seems to be like a long cinema, like a 10, ten hour cinematic. Um, so, uh, and then you lose your child, and then so there's like a killer that's on the loose, and so they're, they're sort of cycling between your story. And then a, a psychic detective story or something, and and then a female cop, and I forget the other character. There's one other character, isn't there? Maybe it's just three. I thought there was four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, uh, well, that wasn't the psychic detective. <laughs> okay. Um, um, and and but the the nice the, the interesting thing about that game is that your your choices do have a, a impact on how the story plays out. And if you die, you're dead. Like, which is unusual for games. Usually there's, you know, there's, oh yeah, you can start again, that's all right. We'll pretend that didn't happen. Um, and he also has another game out uh, recently, Beyond Two Souls, which I'm a bit more familiar with. Um, oh no, 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 never mind. No, no, I'm not taking us off Heavy Rain. Let's talk no, about I Heavy just, Rain. <laughs> I just was interested in, in how, um, when you said how your decisions really matter in that mm -hmm. game. And that's kind of one of those interesting things. So I'd like to talk about that a little more. Like, um, well, <clears throat> actually, so that's what I, where I stuck myself when you asked me the last question. <laughs> well, actually, I'm going to derail on what I haven't said. <laughs> <clears throat> you know, when 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 cinema appeared, at first it was you would film theater plays, literally. And so that's why the f for the first, I think, 20 years, everything was sideways. And oh, no, 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 and we do this, and blah, blah, and there, there's an insert. It actually took them 30 years to have the, the shot, counter shot, you know, like to, when we discuss, to have that axis broken. And so really, at first, movies were filmed <coughs> theater. And then it gradually evolved into its own shape, like it actually assumed it, the, the, me, the medium itself and then it could actually become what it could be. And 30 years is the, the time it took them to actually do that, that trick. And we're pretty much like 30 years in video game right now. So that's pretty much where we are. And so to me, we're still kind of like watching a movie with a joypad attached. And it's actually interesting when you look at uh, Mo uh, Call of Duty 4, Modern Warfare, it's like Titanic, like the first yeah. level. <laughs> and you're, 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 you're engaged because you're, they ask you to do something, like it requires you to move forward for the, 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 the story to, to progress. But really, you're not, you're not making decisions, you're not really involved, they, they have you engaged, um, and so, you know, I guess, well, I'm not, let's, no. so these games, like David Cage, is actually trying, at least he's trying, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe he's probably trying too much in the verisimilitude mm -hmm. aspect and trying to be photorealistic, which I think is actually missing the point. So almost like saying, painting should be about 
perfect one-to-one -one reproduction of reality. I think that's missing the point. But, well, who am I to talk about this? But <laughs> anyways, <laughs> but, but, but it actually, I think, speaks to what it could be for a theater play. Like, the, the value of interactivity is that you, ha you engage your audience or you engage your, your players. Or your, your, your. And, and it could, you could just engage them and it actually just unfolds like a typical linear story. And the main way for you to convey emotion to your audience is through linear storytelling and empathy and, and you know these emotions. But where it actually diverges is interaction is about I make my own actions, I make my own decisions. And, and so, and the line becomes, I, well, I, I don't, well, maybe some of them actually solved that already, but, but that's really the line. It's like, what is your pr primary mean of interaction, of, 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 in, of making your audience experience something? Is it through empathy? Because I care for these characters, or is it through interaction? I, it's gonna be meaningful for me because I'm making these choices, and maybe, maybe there are choices, but I experience them because I'm making these decisions myself compared to seeing characters that have a dilemma and experience that dilemma, and all your supporting means create, you know, create suspension of these beliefs, so I, I, I identify and I'm in empathy with that character compared to I'm really facing that choice myself. So, and, I, and the thing is, I think, or I haven't solved it, <laughs> but I think so far, you have to take one axis as the primary axis and use the other one as support. Like you could say, I want my audience to feel uh, these emotions through empathy and use interaction as a secondary mean as engagement or make sure that you put your users or audience in a situation where they experience that conundrum through having to make that decision and the story, the, you know, the delivery of the story is actually a supportive mean, mean as uh, you know, the, the aesthetic experience to keep you engaged with the fantasy. So, uh, you know. But, uh, I mean, so I, I think that's actually true for, for certain types of games. Um, but I think, and I think it's, it's, I think it's where a lot of this kind of discussion kind of falls to, but I think it ends up, um, as a result, we have a tendency to get too caught up in, I think, that kind of, that one model. Um, and, uh, you know, and I think it ends up sort of limiting, you know, the sort of possibilities of the, you know, of, of both kind of interaction and, and storytelling in, in doing so. Um, as we were talking about earlier, I mean, I first kind of, I was first involved in this type of a discussion 20 years ago um, at uh, an interactive story system symposium um, that was run by the American Institute for Artificial Intelligence. Um, and I remember on on the first day, somebody got up on the whiteboard and they drew a line on the whiteboard and on one end of the line they wrote storytelling and the other end where they were interactivity and they started going this talk about how about finding that kind of perfect place, like where was the perfect place in the middle there? Um, and, and that just sort of set the tone for this whole thing and, and it drove me nuts to be quite honest um, because all the conversations you know, over the next two days seemed to be about, well, you know, as writers, how do we keep the player from doing the wrong thing? <laughs> like that was the big question. It's like, how do we keep them from doing the wrong thing? And, and the example we were talking about before is um, uh, the movie The Fugitive had just come out. And so that was being tossed around as like an example. If you made the game of The Fugitive, and you know, and what do you do, someone asked, if, you know, if the player as, as Richard Kimball gets on a train to Mexico, you know, well, it's like, you know, story's not in Mexico, and now he's in Mexico. It's like, we're stuck. And people are talking about, well, maybe the weather in Mexico can be bad. And that'll convince him to turn around. Maybe the train breaks down. It's like, first to me, it was like, why is there a train in Mexico in your game? 
Um, and, uh, you know, and, and it just seemed to be like, it was like, well, if you really just want to tell the story of the fugitive, then you haven't, then there is no role for the, for the person to do it. I mean, there's this sort of fantasy of like, we'll create this environment where we're going to tell this sort of plot point for plot point story and the player is just going to magically just do all the right things. You know, but that assumes that the player is this character that you've defined that would do those things in that in that order. Um, and you know, and every person you bring, they're they're not going to be the character you wrote. They're the person. They're all the stuff they bring to it. Um, so no, actually, when you watch a movie or you read a, st a story, like. you see the, the, the characters do bad decisions. Mm -hmm. And that's one of these moments where you care, you know. No, no, don't, don't, don't drink poison, poison because she's not really dead. She's just faking, don't, don't kill yourself. <laughs> don't do it, don't do it, right? The, and and you, so you engage through empathy. The problem is in a game, you know, I, I will not drink the poison. The, the, the poison, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to kill myself because you, you're trying to win. So, so I understand that, you know, it's, it's not a, a, a total dichotomy, but, but I, I still think there's a, a, a branch at where, what, what is my primary motivation? Well, I, I guess my point is that if, you're, if your goal is to have, and then I think there, you know, we talk about there are sort of examples, even kind of within the realm of games where I think that this has been successful, but I think if your goal is to create a set of characters that we are supposed to, you know, empathize with, and we're supposed to kind of watch their story portray, which is what, you know, this is where the empathy comes from, is seeing their sort of story play out, then, you know, then maybe a game is not the right medium for this, right? And so one of the things that was, was to, to, fin to end the interactive story system symposium story, um, at the end of the two days, I was actually getting very frustrated. In fact, there was one point where um, uh, Brenda Laurel, who wrote Computers as Theater, got up and left. And I was like, oh, I, can't, I totally get it. I just want to do that too. But um, it turned out she was just sick. But I was like, oh, she's making a <laughs> protest against this. Like, um, And so, but the last day I got up and I said, you know, um, I told the story about, you know, that I had this, this story that I just optioned and I wanted to make a game out of it. You know, it was a story of these... You know, four childhood friends who, you know, they arrive in Atlantic City. You know, they've got a little bit of money they've saved up, and it's, you know, during the real estate boom in, in Atlantic City, and they start buying, you know, you know, they start developing the land, and they start, you know, and over time, you know, they kind of team up with each other, they, the alliances are formed, people's, you know, stabbed in the back, um, you know, friendships are broken up, and, and, you know, eventually it's just, there's two of them left, and it becomes this, like, you know, this, just this conflict, you know, to the death to like see who's gonna you know come out you know kind of come out on top and like um and just the, the relationships they had going it's like are all kind of been just destroyed by this you know um and uh you know i said but you know i'm still struggling with you know kind of how to come up you know with to make a game out of this and you know and then i found out that someone had already done it and they'd done it a hundred years ago and they called it monopoly <laughs> <laughs> and um and the thing about monopoly is that if you look at like any game of monopoly there is a, a narrative arc that flows through every single game of Monopoly that's ever been played in 100 years since it was made, or 110 years now since it was uh, created. Um, that starts with, you know, that takes on one form at the beginning of the game where everyone's just buying up property. Like, and that's the whole start of the game is that like every turn results in people buying up property around the board. And there's, and the game fundamentally changes at the point where all the property is now bought. Because now it becomes about you know, trading with others and a lot, you know, and making alliances and so forth. And the game then fundamentally changes again when you're down to the last two people. You know, and you know, and because then it becomes about like, you know, as I said, it's that kind of race to the death to see who's, you know, and as so that that arc kind of plays out in every single game. You know, I mean, it ch changes a little bit if you change the rules and everyone's got house rules. But but even then, once you define those house rules, then the arc is slightly different. But that arc persists. Um, but that's not written down anywhere. There's nowhere in the rules that you say that the game is going to go through those phases. And yet it is a function of the way the game is designed. 
you know, and, and I said it's, it's kind of, that's the sort of implicit narrative of monopoly. Um, and, uh, you know, so there's kind of a more recent example, and I sent that out, um, was uh, Brenda Romero, a game designer who's been working forever, um, worked on the original Wizardry games back in, you know, pre-8-bit days, and, um, and uh, she's worked on, a, recently worked on a series of, of non-digital games, um, and it's a series called The Mechanic is the Message. She's taken on different sort of cultural issues um, and made board games out of them. And one of the games is called The New World, and it was actually kind of, she made it up on the spot with her eight-year-old daughter one day. Um, her daughter had come home from school where they had just learned about the Middle Passage. And, uh, and her daughter's father was black, so the Middle Passage is the story of the slaves being brought over to America. So it was like a, you know, it was an important thing in their, in their family. Um, and Brenda was very, you know, it's great. They're, they're finally learning this. She's old enough to, to, to learn this. It's great. We're going to have a discussion about this and how it affects. And she asked her daughter what they learned. And uh, she basically just described kind of the, the sequence of events that the historical sort of sequence of events that it, you know, started with the, you know, slavery and ended with the abolishment of slavery and, you know, and now they're here and now there's no slavery and that's great. And, you know, as Brenda put it, 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 sound, it seemed to her, it, she could have just as easily been describing like a cruise ship from Africa rather than what it was. And so, um, you know, her daughter was like, well, can we play a game? And Brenda was like, okay. And so what she did is um, she had all these little like pieces, these little wooden figures, which she has for designing games. Um, she's got dozens, so they, she grabbed a bunch of them, and they spent the next hour painting like little sets of them in different colors for different families. So they had pink ones, and little yellow ones, and blue ones, and so forth. And when they were done, um, Brenda then just basically takes a whole bunch of, you know, scoops them up at random, um, and puts them in the boat, which is just an index card. Um, and her daughter's first question was like, well, mommy, you know, the the little blue family, the babies from the little family aren't, aren't with the, the, the mama, you know, and, or the daddy's not with the, and, you know, she's like, and she was like, no, that's the way it's played. And, and, so, and then the rules were simply, they had 10 turns to get across, and they had 30 units of food, and then every turn they would roll a die, and that's how many units of food would give you, so. And as, you know, as she's playing, she ends up rolling a number of, like, the daughter ends up rolling a number of, like, high rolls pretty early. And at some point, she turns to her mo mother and she says, Mom, I don't think we're going to make it. And her mom was like, well, okay, we've got to make a decision now. Do you put the, you know, we either try to, like, cross our fingers and hope for the best, or maybe we have to put some people in the water so we can, you know, use less food as we go over. And, you know, and, her, like, when they got through this, her, her daughter was like, well, Mommy, is, is that what really happened? And, and she was like, yeah, that's what happened. And, you know, and so playing this and sort of, as I said, sort of the implicit narrative in that very simple game, you know, conveyed that message um, much more than this, you know, the sort of the, the recounting of the just the historical events that went, led up to it. You know, and for me, that's kind of an example, which is a powerful example of using the sort of interaction, interactivity to convey a story. And as I said, you can say there's a very specific narrative that's being conveyed there that's, in, you know, that just is implicit in that design. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for which that medium is probably the most powerful medium she could deliver that message in. So is that the sort of equivalent of interaction design portion of the game uh, or well, the rules or whatever? So that would be system design. But actually, I agree, you just use different words. I, I don't say, you know, that interaction to me is like that decision conveys the meaning, the message. Mm -hmm. You said it conveys a story. To me, story is another way to convey a message. Mm -hmm. But in that case, it's really that decision. Even though you you built the fact that you you you, you cared for the, the the blue ones and the pink ones through, I would say, more of an, a, a passive mean. Mm -hmm. But the key point where you have that insight, oh, that's what happened, is because you had to make that choice. Yeah. So I mean, I agree. You just use different words, but I agree. Whoa. <laughs> oh my, it's time to take a little break, isn't it? Um, so we'll, we're just going to give everybody a little break um, and just bio break and, and come back in 
if you can, in five minutes, and we will um, I get you to ask some questions. Thanks. Uh, I thought it was warm in here, but yes. you know, it's cooled off a bit. Yeah. yeah. Uh, wow. So good. It's okay. Ticking by. The time's just ticking by. I guess it's the same in movies. Yeah. The one that comes to mind, well, maybe you see some blood, but in Scarface, yeah. the, 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 the scene with the chainsaw in the shower, you, you, don't, you don't see it. But actually, the, the, the director said, you hit the audience so hard in the first 10 minutes that they're going to stay put for the rest of the movie, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So it's about suggestion. You know? It's not only linked to video games, I think it's more the, the maturity of the, the artist. Mm -hmm. Do you really have to spill the guts or can you suggest it? And imagination is way more mm -hmm. powerful, I guess. But I guess, you know, different audiences, different types of, depending on, depending on how you want to reach, maybe you want to spill more or less guts. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um. Going back to what you were saying about uh, Monopoly uh, having a specific narrative, uh, how important do you feel that something like the story depth is to for this to be an explicit narrative? Because I'm thinking of games like, uh, well, especially with a game like Minecraft, you have an implicit narrative in some ways, in that you have like the creepers that are kind of creating some amount of implied narrative in the world through the fact that they're sort of these zombie creatures or whatever they are. So that's a sort of implied narrative, very light. Um, whereas the emergent narrative is what uh, a game like Minecraft is essentially reliant on, which is what the players are doing, how they're acting in the world, the stuff they're building creates an, a narrative for them that sort of just purely emerges out of their actions. So there's sort of that other line. Um, it's, it's the stories you tell of the experience you have. Yeah, exactly. So sort of a third line that I think you get from games like that. And Dead Revolution also has implied narrative through uh, basically its own little progression system. So. There was somebody over there. Uh, one of the favorite games that I've played in the last few years was the uh, Portal series, mm -hmm. um, which struck me as a pretty beautiful marriage of, because I think it started actually as a physics engine that was modded from mm -hmm. Far Cry, I think, or anyway, it was based around a gameplay mechanic, and then this, the storytelling is great, and the dialogue mm -hmm. is great, the art direction is great. Uh, I'm curious, from your perspective, as people behind the scenes, what is, what is it that puts together that What is the answer? <laughs> what is, uh, what, yeah, uh, so you're asking what is, is it that um, creates the synthesis of an 
an excellent game experience in it. I'm sure it's... Um, well, you know, it makes me think it's not really theater, but in movies, you can actually treat non-human character uh, entities are, as characters. Mm -hmm. You can treat... Uh, the one that co comes to mind is uh, that movie in Africa with Leonardo DiCaprio... Blood Diamond? Blood Diamond, mm -hmm. where the landscapes mm -hmm. are almost react to the, the, the plot twist and you know it's, it's almost like saying oh you know when you're sad when the, when the main character is sad it's gonna rain mm -hmm. so that's almost like saying the environment is, is, is part of it's almost treated like a character uh, in theater I guess you know with light and you could even have like drapes and you could you, you could also it's all it's just like yeah, using an, an, an animated element as con a conveyor of, 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 of meaning. Yeah. The, one of the um, one of the games that we actually had out there, which we haven't talked about at all, but I think is, is relevant here, is the game Gone Home, um, which was from the, the Fulbright Company. Um, and uh, the premise of this game, and you'll, I think you'll see why it's relevant to this, is um, the premise of the game is that uh, you've just returned home from a year abroad. Um, your parents, in the time that you've been away, have moved into a new house. Um, and so when you arrive at the house, you know, the house is unfamiliar, but you feel comfortable entering it because it is, you know, it is your house. Um, and, but nobody's home. And, you know, and so your parents and your younger sister aren't there, um, and it's rainy out and it's, it's dark, um, and the game is entirely about just traveling around the house, um, you know, finding just different artifacts in the environment, you know, letters that the sister has written to her friend and, um, you know, the pamphlet from the marriage counselor that the parents left on a table in their study. And, um, and as you sort of move through the space, and the, the whole experience is about two to three hours long, um, you learn the story of what's happened and kind of where everybody is and what's happened while you were gone. Um, and it's an incredibly like, emotional, powerful experience, but it's all done through this kind of this environmental interaction. Um, you know, and there's certainly very little that you know, was done in that that couldn't be done kind of in an, an actual physical environment, a theatrical space. Um, and there are people who definitely sort of played with that. But um, you know, the great thing about this is there, there are no other characters. You know, there's no animated characters in it at all. Like even you, it's first person, so you don't have no body and, there, and you can count anything. But there's this whole entire story that unfolds. Just you know, and then and and there's this kind of like primary narrative that kind of unfolds. But then there's also all these other things that you learn about. You know, what your parents have been kind of going through and what their life is like, and um, that come along the way and that are just done through this kind of interaction. It's actually, you know, um, I think it's a sort of a brilliant game. But it's also kind of as we were talking before. You know, it also provoked articles like, you know, there was one that, you know, the title of which was like, How is Gone Home a Game? You know, and people question whether or not it's a game at all. You know, there's there's no, you know, you know there's no, there's no kind of, there's no win-lose even momentarily mechanics. You know, there's no skill that one has to learn to play. It's like, you know, yeah. Ravel's Bolero is it even music? Yeah. Because it's the same thing all Right, all exactly. <laughs> you know, and that's why I said, you know, we talk about it's like, you know, there's kind of the wrong questions. I mean, I guess there may be some an academic interest in kind of being able to define what constitutes a game and what doesn't, but I think, I don't know that it solves a problem for either the audience or the creators to be able to, to, to try to pin that down. There's a question over here. Um, yes, I'm just curious because um, we've been talking about using the environment as a way for a character or to players to pigeon to actually create an, um, a narrative. I guess I'm wondering if it would be possible in theater to be able to create a theatrical piece where you could use, where the, the audience members can <coughs> act as actors and create their own meaning through making decisions. I guess, have any of you ever seen anything like this? Do you think this would be possible? Where the audience members interact with the actors and create make decisions to create well I uh, the only thing I can think of right off the top of my head is the uh, <coughs> what's it called the oak tree that um, basically every night there was a different person playing one of the characters who was on book <coughs> and it didn't 
I mean, it was certainly created a different experience for the, everybody who saw it, not to mention the people who were in it, but uh, there was another, I'm <coughs> sorry, I'm going to, question? have a very cynical answer to this. Okay, I was going to say that. Because I have an optimistic answer. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Um, well, <clears throat> what you're describing, you know, the, the race for uh, photorealism and more realistic effects and everything, it's mainly driven by the established big companies. They, they rely on better graphics, uh, more polygons, Assets, bigger maps. I won't, I, won't, I won't give any names yeah. because I'm not just in good standing for people. But, but I mean, and obviously, you know, it looks to me like that's that's one way. It's what you want, instead of saying what do they really want, because that's easy for them to say. We have the the money, we have the edge, we have the big computers, so we're going to push some polygons on the screen and tell you that's what you want, right? So what's the good side of this? Okay, <laughs> so here's my optimistic take on that answer. Um, I actually think we're right now going through a, a fairly significant phase um, in game development. I, I don't think that the big AAA blockbusters are going to go away um, by any means. I mean, we still have big AAA blockbuster movies and they continue to be made. Um, but what we've seen over the last five years, and there's a number of things that feed into this, um, is... You know, an independent games sort of scene and kind of movement that's gone beyond that. Largely started off as people, you know, you know, a lot of kind of eight bit nostalgia because it was people what people could do. You know, people would just wanted to make a game and put it out there. Um, but what we're seeing now is um, a few different things that are happening. Um, one, we're seeing a number of people who are kind of leaving the AAA game industry to work on independent titles because. They've gotten older, you know. Maybe they have kids. Maybe they have just had life experience, and they're it's for twenty dollars a month. You can download the whole thing, you know, and make your own game with it. And um, you know, and so um, it's gotten to the point where you can actually build some fairly you know, sophisticated experiences with a relatively small group of people um, for a much smaller amount of money. And um, and so what I think we're going to see, fortunately, is that. Um, in much the same way that um, you know, independent film then goes on to inform sort of bigger budget film as, as certain things become successful, mm -hmm. we're starting to see as kind of these independent games, certain ones become successful, um, that the sort of the aesthetics and the kinds of things going into them start to inform much bigger budget um, games, and so that's why I'm, I'm optimistic because I actually see this field growing and you know a lot going on in there um, right now. Mm -hmm. Matt is itching to say something. No, I just like very much agree with both of you. <laughs> <laughs> My answer kind of sits right on the middle, but 
Also, I do still enjoy those big budget games. Yeah. Like if it's a cinematic experience, like I love, yeah, I, I, like I, that's still something that I crave, but it's not something I need. So like I love indie games that have a few pixels in them and that's it. Like um, it, it's using the right tool for what, what, the, what your vision is, right? Like so it shouldn't just be default, you know, great yeah, vision. Yeah, as I said, I mean, I think there's, there's nothing wrong sort of big, beautiful games with lots of, you know, high-res textures and explosions and mm-hmm. ext- incredibly well-animated characters. Um, mm-hmm. Detailed But, you know, <laughs> um, but the fact that we're now, like, you know, for the first time, really having sort of legitimately challenging those assumptions so that, you know, so when we'll get to the point, hopefully, where when those decisions are made, they're made because it's the right decision for that experience, not because, well, to make a game, you have to, it has to be X, Y, and Z. One there, one there, and one there, and we're just about, are you, or, okay, let's start with, I'm um, oh, sorry. Well, actually, the Minecraft came out, I think, similarities um, between video games and the Xbox and Xbox 3, and so Dinosaur was followed by Balrog, by Romantic Vision, by Real Vision, by Cupid and Stardust. I think Is I, it important to have a researcher on yeah. the team? <laughs> or a dramaturg? <laughs> As we, I've worked with researchers yeah. on my teams. Um, uh, I worked in a Pirates of the Caribbean RPG, and we hired somebody to be like an expert in 18th century culture, essentially, and dialect. I don't know if that's quite what you, <laughs> <laughs> you mean, but th- they are you sometimes, because, yeah, you don't... Maybe so, like other... You know, the rest of us don't have time to be researching. We, we need someone to go out there and be like, here you go, here's a little uh, presentation about what you need to know. But, yeah. I mean, I do think it, I think it depends on, you know, on the type of game, the type mm-hmm. of experience you're creating. But, um, but I also think that, you know, it's people who, you know, it's, it's people who are doing that that are, you know, that I think, you know, these sort of innovative games, um, and these kind of new experiences that, that come out of that, um, and uh, I mean, I like the I love the example of Minecraft because you know there's almost it almost seems counterintuitive that it should have been so successful be, for the very reason that well it's just you're doing all these big blocky things and very primitive, but if you look at you know if you look at the interaction model you know you're giving you know it's about people sort of building things, and yeah he could have gone in and made it like oh this this perfect like you know ultra realistic landscape thing and it would have been incredibly difficult for people to get the results they wanted to get they would have to learn you know, a, you know they'd have to become highly skilled at using the tools to be able to sort of craft something that kind of fit that you know mm-hmm. aesthetic and fit that model and yet but by making it kind of giving it that visual style made it so that pretty much anyone you know big giant blocks what could you make out of them you know that constraint kind of gave you know made it that anybody could build anything didn't matter how good or bad you are, it was going to be blocky. But you could build any blocky thing that your imagination could come up with. Um, I just want to say yes, dramaturgs, video game industries, for that. Yeah. Um, the one thing I wanted to ask was, um, those of us in the theater community know this painfully, that when you're walking to a preview in opening night, you know if something's working, and you know if something's not working. Um, same with the film screening, you 
you go to a screening, you can be there with your audience, and you know when it's not working. Um, I'm just wondering for you guys individually and personally, where most of the feedback comes from for you guys, because if, if, if we see all, all of ourselves as artists, I think on a personal and individual level, we are looking for feedback in our work. So when you have a game that's put together in its whole form, I mean, how do you each individually get feedback from your audiences? Because something tells me that it, it's a little bit more difficult for games than a play, which you can see on opening night, or a screening, or a, a movie screen. A movie screen. So how do you get feedback? Is well, I mean, we certainly do have people who come and, and play the games, <coughs> right? Um, and, you know, and, you know, and it's often it's during that, that process that something, um, you know, either something that you thought worked because now that you've played it a gazillion times, you're really good at it. But when someone comes in to play it and like, and they're struggling and, and stumbling over themselves and they can't figure it out, you know, a lot of that stuff gets revealed in that in, in that part of the process. Um, and you know, and you know, ideally we try to do that as early on as we can. You know, as we start to develop mechanics and, and things like that or elements that we try to to make sure that they're working in the way that we think that we're working, or at least that our intention is, is, is coming across. Um, you know, I've seen that, you know, I've seen that process sort of, I've taken to, um, you know, used for evil, I'll say sort of for good, or, or taken to, you know, um, because I've also seen that process used to try to validate the intention of a piece, and I think, you know, and. And I think that for, for any work, if you have to ask somebody else whether what you're doing is worth doing, then you probably aren't the person to be doing it. I think there's, mm -hmm. there's a level where you have to, you know, you have to have the confidence that at least your intention is right. You can ask people whether your intention is, is being successfully conveyed, you know, through either the work or through, you know, the, the gameplay or through the story or through whatever. Um, but I think if you don't, if you don't have the confidence that, you know, in the, in, you know, in the intention that's at the core of it, and as I said, I think that's where a lot of games kind of go astray, um, is that people, there isn't a confidence in the intention, so they keep looking around for someone to tell them what game to make, and eventually, like, everybody's got a different idea of what game they're supposed to be making, because they've all asked different people what game they should make, you know, and I think that would be like, you know, asking people, like, you know, well, you know, what period should we put, you know, this production of Richard III in, and you gotta ask the audience what they wanna see, because I, I can't decide as the director, you know, it's like, yeah, I, I think on that note, when anyone comes to me and say, what should I do? Should I make it blue or red, or should it be plus two or plus 20? I ask them, what is it you want to make? And I don't even want to give them an answer on how to implement it. I just tell them, it means you, you're you not able to say what is it you're trying to achieve, so you cannot evaluate the different solutions. So uh, I just point them at the question they're missing, not the solution. And in the everyday, as far as testing, we also have QA testers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they provide feedback. Um, there is that problem of being too close to the material, because even us in the studio will give feedback on where, how the game is feeling. Um, although the, probably the most valuable feedback you'll ever get from a member of the studio is when they first start. And they have just carte blanche. Like, Here, play this game, give us your feedback. Because they're informed, they know, they, they can offer solutions, they can speak intelligently about it, but they have no preconceived notions and no investment in what is in them. I know you have been dying to talk and you <laughs> haven't <laughs> talked yet, so you get the last question. Uh, part, part of what I wanted to, to say was to answer a question that was asked earlier. Um, having spent far too much time for my own good studying interactivity in theater, there are a lot of groups who started doing that now, and they borrow a lot of game mechanics, actually, in the way that they put it together. Um, you have companies like Punch Drunk out of the UK who use navigation as their main form of interactivity. So you can navigate to different, you can walk through a building to different parts of a performance and see different things in different orders and construct your own story. You have others um, like Tony and Tina's Wedding, for example, which have linear stories where people can have conversations in the middle to very much along the same lines as a standard, unfortunately, standard RPG game type format. Um, so there are a number of examples of that. If you want the details, I can give them to you later. My question, though, for you, though, is to turn that around. Um, Alex, you talked about film moving past theater and becoming its own medium. 
I'm a little bit curious what, if anything, you see games being able to learn from theater at this point. So is there anything that games can learn from theater? <coughs> well, you know, we, we discussed like what makes a good game and, and you also described the way sometimes the studio heads decide what games should be or what the story should be. I think, I think what's really missing in the video game industry is, even though it's the youngest entertainment industry, it's also the most profitable. And, and the, but the thing is, it became very quickly a very industrious industry. And, and so I think, and that's, that's the way I work, I always go back to other creative industries and I, and I look at the creative process and say, this works there. It works for movies. I, I haven't looked much into theater, but you know, it's the same process, the creative process. And I think it's really a matter of what what the industry at large, like the AAA studios, but also the indies that go on the gut feeling type stuff, like understanding how, how to structure the creative process and how to understand established intention and how to have different discipline specialists and to empower them not only to give solutions but also to shape back what the intention is that top down bottom up creative process has been around for centuries millenniums <laughs> well, in the case of, of writing in the case of theater in the case of movies and it feels like the video game industry is kind of we just like Charles, you know, you call us gamers, but, and, and most, I mean, you guys said, yo, we're gamers, I'm not a gamer, I want to be a game developer, and I want to, us to mature, and so that's where we say, okay, you have to, oh, my quote is, you don't get, get high on your own supply, <laughs> <laughs> you have to realize, and that's the most, most people want to make video games because they like playing video games. But you like, we like driving cars. Would you like building a car? No. It's a very different process. So, I mean, as you said, we're too close from the subject matter. And we're kind of like toy, you know, kids playing in a, in a sandbox. And we think, oh, I love making castles. So, so let's build the sandbox. No, it's a different thing. So we, we don't have the, you know, we haven't. We, we need to take a step back, and that's from looking at other creative industries or creative endeavors. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, that, that, that's what I think. Yeah, it's, a, it's a type of creative discipline. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Um, there is process design. Yeah. That's what we do. Yeah, so <laughs> there, there is actually one which isn't directly related to writing, but um, it's something that, that's always intriguing and has to do with the kind of work that I do, um, is that uh, I think a lot of games, especially the big AAA games right now, borrow um, a lot of the, the kind of visual language from film, or try to borrow this sort of visual language from film. Um, but for me, that because I deal with animation and performance, um, I actually think that uh, you know the sort of performance language of theater is actually much more relevant um, than that of film, because in film you're constructing a frame, like that is what you're doing. You are positioning the actors in the frame relative to the frame, um, and you know, and that's how it's built. Whereas in, in many of these games that we talk about, you don't have that control over the camera, you know, and or you have limited control, and you have very limited control over where of the, of the player's sort of point of view relative to that. So, so much of what we're trying to do is actually define the relationships between the characters that you're encountering, um, and to do it in such a way that we understand, you know. Know, their status relative to each other and their positioning relative to each other and in a way um, you know that we can block that out um, that doesn't rely on you know a fixed you know a fixed frame or, or a, um, fixed editing and, and then so forth um, and it's something I don't think you know because you know it's one of the things that I spend a lot of time with animators working with animators who are new to games um, because you know, many of them come from doing animation where you have even more control over the frame than in, you know, than in traditional film, where you're defining absolutely everything as an animator and having to, you know, and having to, to talk to them about that it's not about, we're not defining silhouettes and poses relative to the frame. You kind of give that up and have to think about this more in terms of, you know, 
who are the characters and, and how you know, what are their relationships to each other and how do we define that relationship by how you know how they move to, you know, relative to each other in the space. So that's something which I I'm, you know, I think can be drawn from theater and I'm something I try to push and uh, hopefully that we'll draw more from. Amanda, um, I think. One of the things that, or that we can take from theater is I think theater, there's more of an emphasis on the creative and the experimentation. Because we are a lucrative industry, there is a lot of fear of taking risks. An awful lot of fear, especially in the AAA space. Um, it is nice that the indie scene is coming out because like you say, like if they get success, then the AAAs are gonna be more likely to kind of follow suit. Um, but I think we can learn a lot from like you guys are doing some of the heavy lifting for us in some <laughs> cases. It's like, what have they done? You will take that. Um, and also, it's it, as far as iteration and it's and it's it just takes longer too with games. Like it's not something you can just you know act out and figure out and like get a good feel for it. Sometimes just the the technical limitations and all that can kind of slow down that process a little bit. Um, but yeah, I think that is what we can learn a lot from theater is to be older <laughs> and uh, to take those risks um, and not worry so much about trying to please everyone and not upsetting anyone um, in order to try to, to, to get the most respect because I think in the end that it's just we're just going to keep making the same kind of bland games and I think audiences are asking for some variation. I think it's less that they're asking for a higher fidelity and now they're like okay these games that now are on sequel five were really great when they first came out, but like I'm, I'm really craving the, the AAA new title that gets me excited. Like they they come out every so often, but doesn't feel as often as they used to. I'm afraid that's it for um, the formal part of this presentation. I'm sure you can talk outside while they show you how to. <laughs> access these games um, and I just have a lot of a few thank yous. Um, I'd like to say thank you to Alice Honigen who created this event and who's sitting back there with her headphones on. Um, our speakers A. Thomas Goldberg, Amanda Duaro and Alexander Mandrika. Uh, Vijay Matthew from Colorado. <laughs> Um, VJ Matthews from HowlRound, who's on the other end of that video. Um, Christopher Grabowski, our videographer. Our volunteers today, Matthew Willis and James Tyler Irvin. Michael Sider for technical advice. Cartem's Dona Tree. Um, community members who helped share this event broadly. Pie Theater, Rice Paper Magazine, Vancouver Fringe, Firehall Arts Theater. Susanna Scarrell, Ben Wabus and uh, really helped getting in, in the game community. We really appreciate being visited by strangers. Don't be a stranger <laughs> anymore. Um, and I'd like to also thank our fearless leader, Heidi Taylor, the artistic director of PTC. Catherine <laughs> <laughs> Clarity, our host and dramaturg extraordinaire. Go thank you all. <laughs> Donut left, but <laughs> <laughs> thanks for coming.